Hey everybody, this is Pastor Megan Rohr, still uh, live from the living room, but now with some better lighting because, hey, our homestay here in San Francisco just got extended all the way through the beginning of May. So if we're going to keep doing these videos, we might as well make my skin look beautiful. Today we're going to talk about Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, Palm and Passion Sunday is, is what's coming up in the Bible readings for Sunday. However, there is so much more to say about it than is necessarily appropriate for any one sermon. And me being able to get out all of this Bible study right now means that I'll just preach one sermon instead of like five sermons. So today, which is uh, Monday, if you're watching this live, uh, I'm going to talk about Palm Sunday and all the different Bible references about Palm Sunday, and that's going to include ways you can modify Palm Sunday if you're stuck in your house and you can't go to church. Uh, there are traditions all over the world, and they don't all use palm leaves, like if you don't just happen to have some around. Uh, so we'll talk about that towards the end of the video. And then on Wednesday, uh, we will be talking about, that's April 1st, on Wednesday, April 1st, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on my Facebook, Reverend Dr. Megan Rohr. Uh, I'll be talking about Passion Sunday, which is this, uh, our worship service is going to have both, bits of palm, bits of passion, and it'll, it'll set you up for what the whole stage is for next week as we get closer to this, this celebration or commemoration of Jesus' death. Today, Palm Sunday. And the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to talk about the ways that the Palm Sunday readings are different in each of the Gospels. Well, before we get to the four Gospels, let's start with the book of Zechariah. It's a very popular one. I'm sure you've got it all memorized, right? Okay, me neither. I looked it up. The book of Zechariah is where this idea of the king of Israel coming into Jerusalem in glory has its origination. And the text is from chapter 9. Verse 9 is where it starts talking about that. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jer Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. You know what I'm wondering? I wonder if my sound was bad because this was plugged in and I wasn't using it. If so, sorry about that. Uh, so we're going to start our, our talk about Palm Sunday from the book of Zechariah, uh, which reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's confusing, right? That translation right there. It both says a donkey and a colt, which is like what a horse and a donkey mate. We're going to see that coming up in the Gospels. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And then there's this long text about how a big battle is going to happen. But what it basically says is that through this Passover promise, this seal of blood on a doorframe, God remembers that the people of Israel, remembers that the Jewish people are beloved and have a birthright. That means that God is going to save them and that this, this Messiah who enters Jerusalem in this way is going to be a part of this Passover promise, a part of this way that some people are saved in God's kingdom. Let's start with the oldest of the, of the Gospels that are written in Greek. That would be Mark, uh, written or be somewhere between 66 AD and 70 AD. And you don't have to take notes. I'm going to put all the notes that I'm using to talk about up on virtualgrace.org. So you'll be able to find them there. Mark's version is in chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. In this version of the text, there are no palms. No palms. Oldest version, no palms. Uh, Jesus tells the disciples to go steal a colt. Remember we said there's both a donkey and a colt in that text from Zechariah. The Gospel of Mark says colt. 
Um, and I'll tell you why that's significant a little bit later. Uh, so there's a cult that, that Jesus wants them to go steal, but Jesus wants a cult that no one else has ever ridden before. So Jesus would be the first person to ride this cult, some sort of reference to things not being used before. So it'd be very grand, right? Jesus does not say that he is a king in this version and many other versions. Um, he says that when they ask why you're taking the colt, say the master needs it and will send it right back. When it says the master needs it, it kind of implies that the person who owns the colt is the one who needs it and will bring it right back. Right? So it, it kind of is vague about whether or not this is known to the person who owns the colt that they're taking it. Then the disciples put their clothes on top of the colt for Jesus to ride it, right? Because there's no accoutrement, for, no saddle for Jesus to ride on. And then people, it's not Jesus actively declaring, hey, I'm entering Jerusalem like king, in a way that kind of flaunts it before the Pharisees or other royal, other, other royal people in, in the Roman hierarchy. The people on their own choose to lay cloaks and small branches of trees, branches of trees in front of him. And then they sing part of Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Right? It's just like a, yay, you're coming. And then Jesus goes to the temple and returns pretty quickly back to Bethany where Jesus came from. The, I'll tell you a little bit about this route that Jesus is taking at the end of talking about all of the gospels too. So that's, that's the version in Mark. The disciples steal a colt. It's a colt no one has written. And Jesus doesn't say he's a king, but other people kind of declare it. Then poof, does the thing at the temple, leaves. Luke's gospel, which is written around 85 and 90, around the same time as Matthew's gospel, still is very similar to what's happening in Mark's version. They go get a cult that no one has ridden, and Jesus does not say he is the king. He, he tells them to say, the master needs it, and he will send it right back. The disciples take the cult, and when then the, the owner of the cult asks them what they're doing. So in this one, like, they sort of get the permission of the person who owns the cult because they're like, our master needs it. And presumably that owner is, like, cool with it. It doesn't say what his response is. But presumably he's cool with it. Uh, people, again, lay down their clothes. There's no request from Jesus for people to treat him this way. Um, but it kind of seems like maybe it's not spontaneous because the disciples maybe are the only ones who are honoring Jesus in this way. Uh, they sing the Psalm from one from Psalm 118 again. Um, but the Pharisees then say, teacher, scold your disciples, tell them to stop. Right? So was this spontaneous or was it choreographed? We don't know. And Jesus answers the Pharisees, I tell you, if they were silent, the stones would shout. Like, like in Isaiah 55, when the trees clap their hands because everyone has to shout out in the will of God, right? And Jesus comes into the city and then Jesus weeps. Jesus weeps. And this is a reference to the fact that the temple is going to be destroyed. Presumably Jesus understands that this is going to happen. This is something that's talked about a little bit later in Mark's gospel, where it talks about, you see all those stones, what large buildings, all will be torn down. Um, and then Jesus kind of leaves them with, if only you knew on this day, the things that lead to peace, right? Basically, if only you knew today how peace could happen. But now they are hidden from your eyes. The time will come when your enemies will build fortifi 
fortifications around you, encircle you and attack you from all sides. They will crush you completely, you and the people within you. They won't leave one stone on top of another because you didn't recognize the time of your gracious visit from God. So Jesus is referring to an actual historical incident in Jerusalem that is going to happen uh, not too much later than, than Mark's gospel. It's called the desolating sacrilege. It's the reason that they dated Mark's gospel when they did is because there was this big time when, when the Roman rulers slaughtered everyone merc mercifully. Um, and it's also referencing that the temple is torn down and then it has Jesus kind of saying like, if only you knew that they were going to destroy this temple, you would like get on board with this plan of peace that Jesus is trying to bring. Right. But very interesting that this is the only text where Jesus weeps for the city. Again, the ancient Greek word for that is splunk nitsomai. It means that Jesus is guts were turned. It also means Jesus could have like vomited. All the all the feelings in Greek times were in the stomach. So they all you kind of it's up to the interpretation of the translator if it's like weeping or sadness or what the strong emotion is. Matthew in Matthew's text, which is also written around the same time as Luke, Matthew's a little bit more interested in showing that Jesus's journey is aligned with what Moses was up to. And so you'll, you'll maybe see that a little bit in this version. Uh, here, the disciples steal a donkey and a colt, both because they have figured out they, that there is controversy about whether or not it's a donkey or it's a colt. So Matthew's gospel is the only one that says Jesus is like a circus. Like, have you ever seen someone entering the circus where they're on like two horses and they stand on each side? Now, this version says Jesus sat on both of them, which is impossible, first of all, uh, but it's a great metaphor, right? So again, we have that reference from Zechariah 9. As Jesus is writing in, the metaphor is, number one, like, we better check this off the list and make sure we got the right translation of Zechariah 9, uh, but also... In the Eastern tradition, the donkey is an animal of peace. The colt is an animal of war, which makes you rethink those previous gospels that we talked about earlier, where it was like seeming like Jesus wanted to come for peace. Um, but if, if riding a, a colt into a city is like, I am going to conquer you, then what does it mean that some of the gospel writers pick the colt over the donkey. Matthew picks both, right? So it's kind of like a yin and a yang thing. Jesus rides both in with peace and war at the same time and maybe is balancing them and can figure out how to sit on both though it's impossible. Uh, it seems like the colt in this story is the child of the donkey and so maybe they wanted to walk that close together. I don't know. So this one is more of a metaphor about the kind of uh, Christ that Jesus is. It's not something that's actually physically possible. Uh, and then the people come out and lay clothes and palm branches. For the first time, we have palm branches. Uh, did I mention that in Luke it was sticks? I think I forgot. Uh, so they put palm branches out and they sing. Uh, again, from Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All right. Then we get a really different version. John is different from all the other Gospels in so many different ways. Um, but here's John's version. It doesn't even say Jesus was like entering yet. The crowd just was there for a festival. And the festival that we think the crowd was there for was the actual king entering Jerusalem through a grate on the very opposite side of the city. And instead of going to greet that king, probably with palm branches, because in, in Roman times, palm branches meant victory in war and triumph. They go to the opposite end of the city 
and greet Jesus instead of the person who's recognized as their king, right? So these are the people going and, and kind of proclaiming that they like Jesus better than their own king. There's no stealing of donkeys. Um, it's just found. And palm branches are for sure in this text. In this one, the disciples seem confused, right? In the last version, the Pharisees are like, your disciples are doing this on purpose, make them stop. In this one, they seem very confused. The text actually says the disciples didn't understand what was happening at first until after Jesus was glorified. Then they remembered this and wrote it down. Uh, maybe this is a sentence that John adds to be like, I know all these extra details. Why weren't they in the previous versions that were written 30 years before this version? Well, they just remembered it. <laughs> so this text, uh, John, is about victory over death. It says very clearly that the reason that people were greeting Jesus with these palm branches were because they had heard the story of of Lazarus being raised from the tomb. Wow, not a coincidence that we just read that text this last Sunday, if you were in church or, or viewed any, uh, that Lazarus is raised from the dead. And so people know that Jesus has conquered death. That's pretty cool. Uh, I have a hunch if someone discovered a cure to the coronavirus right now, we might greet them with palm branches or if someone really did find the fountain of youth that Indiana Jones was looking for in the temple of doom that maybe uh, no it's not the temple of doom it's the other one I don't remember what it's called Indiana Jones if you found it would have been celebrated like yay there's no more death right so this is what they thought was occurring that because Jesus had raised Lazarus from the tomb that death was conquered 100% hooray, like Palm Leaf Nobel Peace Prize, right? Then the Pharisees, instead of just saying like, guys, this is really inappropriate, the Pharisees are jealous. They're not mad that people are declaring that the Roman dude's not the king. They're mad that nobody is honoring them like that. Therefore, the Pharisees said to each other, see, You've accomplished nothing. Look, the whole world is following him. Hmm. We're jealous, right? The, the description here in the Gospel of John is what is used to frame the orthodox understanding of Palm Sunday during this time period. It really is about Jesus' raising of Lazarus from the dead and the ability to like, so Jesus can do this really bold thing that surely will get him killed, you know, entering at the festival in the opposite direction because Jesus is not afraid of death anymore because Jesus has like the miracle perfected. Jesus has got this. Jesus can basically enter whenever they want, wherever they want, because they know how to raise from the dead. So don't worry about the rest of the story is basically um, how this text is interpreted in the Orthodox tradition. Palm processions and, and the route that Jesus takes. In, in the several of the gospels, it says that Jesus comes from the Mount of Olives and then goes to the temple. Um, as I have walked from the Mount of Olives to the temple, I can tell you it's a really steep walk. And I was scared to walk down it too quickly because I thought I would hurt myself and I was a lot younger then. And I cannot imagine doing this on a horse or a donkey. It's super steep and it's all cobblestone. So like slippery. Um, so having some people put some clothes down or some traction or some some leaves and sticks would be a really great way for that brand new colt that no one has ever ridden not to slip the first time they're ever carrying someone down a really steep hill that's cobblestone um, i'm going to put on virtualgrace.org i'll put this video up and then i'll also put a link up to the google map so you can see how short kind of a journey it is as you start from the mount of olives and you go down Guess what you pass on the way there? It's Gethsemane, uh, the place 
where Jesus is going to go and pray, the place where Jesus is going to be captured um, before his trial and before his death, right? So this walk is going to be very similar um, to what's going to happen later. Um, so it's not very far, but it is very steep. And in ancient uh, tradition, the reason it says he's coming from Bethage before this uh, trek and in some of the versions is because that was the route where you took the Paschal lamb before it went to the Temple Mount. And so there is this reference of Jesus being the new lamb, the new Passover lamb. Uh, in ancient Egyptian religion, the palm leaf was carried in funeral processions and represented eternal life. And these palms were also used to celebrate martyrs as a symbol of Christian victory and triumph over death. Revelations 7 says that a crowd of people all wearing white stand before the throne of the lamb holding palm branches, right? So we have lots of scriptural reasons that palms are thought to be significant. Another reason that palms uh, might be a part of this text is because in the Exodus story in chapter 15, those who are wandering in the wilderness find that where there are palm trees, there is water. That's a life-saving place. So in the desert, if you're wandering around, don't just wander around. If you're thirsty and lost, look for the palm trees because that's going to be your greatest hope of being able to find water. And knowing where the water was was what was going to keep you alive in those regions. So the palm also became a major decoration in the temple itself, which could be a reference to the fact that Jesus, so the temple's torn down, but Jesus makes all of these allusions and symbolisms within the gospel text that um, Jesus is going to be the temple. Jesus is going to be the new way that God interacts with people where they are. Um, you can you can find references to the palm trees in the temple in First Kings chapter six, in Second Chronicles chapter three, and there was an idea that these palm leaves were a part of, part of the peace. Uh, there was there's some some stories about how the temple was only able to be built during times of peace, and the palm leaves were the symbolism of that. And um, for Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 40, the palm tree is, is inscribed on gates in various places kind of throughout the temple. The palm in Jewish tradition has kind of a really cool uh, celebration that is one of my favorites that I think if you're going to imagine what it meant to people for there to be a Messiah, uh, that this is a tradition that you should look up and think more about. It's called Sukkah. I might be pronouncing it wrong. Um, S-U-K-K-O-T. And it's a, a festival that comes out of Levit Levit Leviticus. Can't even say the word very well. Leviticus chapter 23. It's a seven-day festival if you live in Israel, an eight-day festival if you live in, in the diaspora. It's a celebration of the harvest. And, and it's, it's really fun. You build a little like shelter uh, and you can put palm leaves on it and you remind yourself of like the harvest of the earth and really beautiful things about that. I like it as someone who has fed the homeless for such a really long time, that the reminder that the Messiah is about feeding people and that those feeding miracles are not just metaphors, they're things that we are supposed to be doing in the world. So there's some sort of, there's a connection to Jesus's coming into Jerusalem, being a part of this harvest, all of the, the grain and harvest metaphors that were a part of Jesus's ministry. Jesus being bread um, is a part of that as well. So if you are like me and you are uh, staying home to try to keep our world just a little bit safer, uh, then you might be wondering, how the heck do we do Palm Sunday? 
online or how do we celebrate Palm Sunday from our houses if we can't go outside? Uh, and so I want to share with you some of the different ways that people have celebrated this Palm Sunday throughout the world because people have already adapted to this and we might as well just, you know, maybe share in some of the, the fun traditions that happen in, in lots of different spaces. So some of these appeal to me, some of these are a little bit more out there. I'll let you decide which ones appeal to you and which ones feel out there for you. So um, in, the, in the Russian Orthodox Church, as I mentioned, uh, they have really celebrated this idea of Lazarus, but they use pussy willows instead of palm branches, right? So they use these things that look like sticks and they have these really cool white fuzzy little buds. Um, because in the, in the Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, where they care very, very, very deeply about whether or not certain things are required or not for how you worship, they've looked at like the canonical gospels and they think, you don't have to have palms. Uh, so they also can use olive branches or whatever branches uh, they have. They get them blessed along with candles that they use at home during these times. Um, and in, in my faith in particular, in, in the Catholic faith as well, um, in the Lutheran faith, we say that in emergencies, all people can perform blessings. So I say, if you are able to go on a walk where you collect sticks that you can bless them and maybe light some candles and have some sticks in your house and remember your palm sunday that way with the nature that's around you in bulgaria um, and in some other places they celebrate palm sunday as flower day and have flowers instead of palm sunday hooray thank you orchid uh, and so well, the other thing that they do is they celebrate all the people who have names that are named after flowers. That's kind of cute. In ancient England, they used to have jack-o'-lantern figures that they burned on fire. Read more about that because I don't understand it, but it sounds like it could be fun if you're in the anger phase of this disease. Um, but in contemporary times, they decorate grapes. Might be a little too morose for right now. Um, in Finland and Syria, children dress up as an Easter witch and they give out coins and candies and pussy willow branches again, right? So not even palm leaves if you don't have them. In Italy and the Middle East, so all through Jerusalem and Palestine, they celebrate with both palms and olive branches. In Lithuania, they use spruce branches because that's what they have nearby and why not? Right? In the Philippines, children dress up as angels. This is one of my favorite. There's a much longer ritual about this, um, but this is the part of it that I like. Little kids dress up as angels and they scatter flower petals. And then the flower petals that they scatter, people like collect them up. And as they're planting the rice in the rice fields, they like put the flower petals out there. That's my favorite one. I'm gonna see if I can make my kid a little angel costumes and throw some flower petals. So times like these, if there is a ritual that works for you, even if it seems strange, maybe it becomes the really cool ritual that someone else uh, needs to take on during this time. As long as you're remembering that the whole purpose of the Jesus story is to name and claim you, to love you, to remind you that peace is possible, um, even if some of the Gospels thought Jesus was coming for war, but to remind you that peace is possible, right? Um, and to just think about what that would mean in your house. And maybe it's like those people who are putting all their clothing down and who are putting those branches down. They were imagining that someone had conquered death by golly, let's imagine it. Let's imagine what our world will be like when coronavirus is conquered. That is the spirit of this time. And however you end up creating ritual around it, I'm, I hope that you will put some comments below about uh, ideas that you have that other people can maybe take part in. Uh, share pictures with me. I want to, if you make little like 
Easter witches costumes. I want to see that for sure. Um, take pictures of the branches that you collect in your physically distanced walks and share them. And let's just like have a new way of having processions, right? Let's, you know, maybe you put, put some of your sticks in the windows so your neighbors can see them and uh, right. Just find joy wherever you can, because we need it during these times. Don't forget that I love you. Man, I love you. Don't forget that God loves you whew, even more than I love you. And um, just do the best you can with each other. Thank you, everybody.